Located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, south of the Tropic of Capricorn, sits Rapa Nui, or more famously known as Easter Island. The island itself is only about 64 square miles, with a large portion of it uninhabitable due to various issues that they've experienced throughout their history. 2,250 miles from the nearest Polynesian island of Pitcairn, and 2,340 miles from the Chilean South American mainland, it is often referred to as one of the most remotely inhabited islands on planet Earth. The local airport receives just two flights a day, and it currently hosts no ports for transport ships along its shorelines. Reaching Rapa Nui is no small feat, and not for the meek or inexperienced traveler. But for some reason, I had this pull a calling to go there. Most people had no idea where Easter Island was when I told them where I was going, or even afterwards when I returned home did they understand where it had been. But as soon as I showed anyone a picture of one of the monolithic statues found there, every person realized that they had seen these famous Moais before, somewhere. The Moai are a fascinating part of the history of Easter Island and one of the main reasons that I did want to travel there. With somewhere between 800 to 1,000 of them created, the history and intention behind them still remains quite vague. Most archaeologists agree that the majority, about 95% of the Moai, were created of Rano Raraku Tuff, mostly from a volcano in the same area, and from the quarry there. There's about 55 other moai that were created from a more dense white stone found on a different piece of the island. The moai range in size from 6 to 33 feet high and can often be found on a platform called an ahu, where as many as 15 can be found in a row. Most of the moai were originally erected to face into a village, with the exception of a few that face the sea but all of the statues hold the gaze of their eyes slightly upward, looking towards the sky. Another name for the island is Mataki Te Rangi, which means eyes towards the heavens. Some say that the Moai were created in the images of kings past. Others argue that they represent different important people of the villages. None of them are said to have the name of a deity. Much of these facts surprised me because my thoughts before going to Easter Island were that the Moai faced the sea in a way of protecting the island and that they did take on the image of a god and that was mostly due to their size and their ambiguity. One thought that an explorer had in 1882 about the Moai was that they were highly respected and thought to have special attributes and possess great powers. Why else would a people create and move so many similar monolithic statues in such a short period of time, completely deforesting their island in the process? The only explainable reason is that they were highly significant to the ancient people. But these real reasons behind the creation and placement of the Moai still remain somewhat of a mystery, and that completely fascinates me. The fact is that Rapa Nui is an enigma. Although it is highly respected theory by historians that the early Polynesians found and populated the island, there remains little hard evidence to prove when or how this may have happened. Much of the history of the island has been wiped out, largely because of the Christian missionaries who came and removed much evidence of their prior culture, partly due to the Peruvian slave traders that at one time kidnapped all but about a hundred of the Rapa Nui and force them into slavery, and also due to various catastrophic events such as earthquakes and tsunamis. And that's just what we know of it and what's agreed upon by mainstream scientists and historians. There are many other more recent theories about Rapa Nui that are not being grandly accepted, but they do warrant a deeper look nonetheless. Popular theories say that Easter Island was formed by three separate volcanic eruptions on the ocean floor beneath the Anastka tectonic plate, and that happened around 1 million to 100,000 years ago. 
The last of the volcanoes is said to have erupted some 10,000 years ago. And it's thought that the island was not settled by humans until sometime between 600 and 900 in AD, with most of the Moai being carved around 1000 to 1600 AD. This is the most historical opinion. But what if the history that we're being told is only a portion of the story? Or better yet, what if it simply is untrue? Back in the 1920s, a topographer named Sir Alfred Watkins noticed when he was surveying the prehistoric landscape in Britain that there were certain alignments, which he termed as ley lines, running through the planet. He found that a huge number of archaeological sites from different periods were formed along these lines, and he went about mapping them out on the planet, creating what is now referred to by many as a planetary energy grid. The same ley line that tracks through Egypt and various sites of these ancient archaeological places there travels straight into Easter Island. In fact, Easter Island is situated on a major energy vortex connecting at least 10 other ley lines on the planet. The name Rapa Nui translates to Navel of the World. The lone archaeological reference to this navel is a circular stone found on the island that legend says was brought by the first settler and king, Hata Matua, who brought it from a mythical land. The stone is said to possess much manas, which is a spiritual power bestowed by the gods, and thus bearing the secrets of the universe inside it. It is said to be the one who collects the most important spiritual energy on the earth. Unfortunately today, that rock, with four other smaller stones of similar matter, is contained in a rock wall and guarded by someone from the national park. So you cannot touch it and you can't feel its energy. So you really don't know what special energy it contains. Regardless, it was my personal experience that the island's energy is extremely potent and palpable from all areas, and those who are sensitive to energy will no doubt feel various different sensations, from heat to vibration and more, throughout their discovery on the island. My friend and travel companion Susie felt immense heat gathering from the core of her body for our entire stay on the island. For myself, I felt my own being vibrating with the island. Certain sites, and particularly the Ahu, where many of the fallen Moai were left abandoned, radiated a vibratory energy that completely disoriented me at times. I was careful to respect the National Park's warnings not to touch the Moai directly. However, when I had a chance to get up close and put my hands on the rocks surrounding it, or on the similar unmarked stone formations found randomly in fields, I was quick to do so. Each location did offer its own sensation to me, validating my feelings that it was more than my own physical issues such as low blood sugar or headaches caused from a concussion I'd recently experienced that was causing this disorientation. The fact is that I left the island healed of any lingering issues that I had from my accident that caused the concussion and the subsequent headaches. So there is a vital and healing energy on the island, my friends, and there's much more to discover for sure. Some theorists suggest that the island was used as a location site by extraterrestrials and point to evidence such as the upward gaze of the Moai that appear to be looking at the sky or the fact that how these monolithic statues were actually moved without destruction to the relatively soft material is still not understood. Regardless of one's feelings of the idea that extraterrestrials visited or were part of creating the significant statues on Easter Island, I found it interesting that NASA extended the airstrip to be able to receive the space shuttle, and also that a facility there was supposedly used to monitor the movements of the NASA tectonic plates by NASA. According to them, these plates creep two centimeters closer to South American mainland every year. Now the NASA facility has been completely abandoned 
and holds another eerie mystery as to why, if the Nazca plates are still moving significantly each year, they decided to abandon the monitoring of this movement on the island. Or was there another reason for their presence there? Other scholars such as Grant Hancock and Colin Wilson now also suggest that Easter Island may have been a part of a larger island and that the original discovery and use of the site may actually be thousands of years earlier in time that predates the Great Floods. Their theory states that 12,000 years ago, when the great ice caps of the last glaciation were still largely unmelted and sea level was 100 meters lower than it is today, it would have formed a chain of antediluvian islands as long as the Andean mountain range. If this is true, then Easter Island was a part of a much larger landmass than it would have been the site of an astronomical observatory for the ancients and a forgotten civilization. Even more interesting is the theory that the melting of the ice caps also occurred with several cataclysmic events, such as crustal displacements, and that changed the actual topography of the planet. So sites such as Easter Island may have very well been located in quite different locations on the planet several thousands of years ago. If this is true, then the evidence of such ancient civilizations could have been lost into the sea forever. And that brings me to just that, the sea. The relentless pulsation of life energy that crashes upon the shores of Rapa Nui Gale, offering no sign of relief is hypnotic, to say the least. I spend time every day, several times a day in fact, gazing into the sea, just as I imagined the earlier Rapa Nui had done. I imagined living on the island a long time ago when there was no way on or off and when that 64 square miles would have been all that anyone living there would have known. It literally was their entire world. They would have spent a lot of time watching the sea, the sunrise, the sunset, the moon, and the stars, wouldn't they? I know I did. In fact, being on Easter Island allowed me to retune my body to the Earth's energy because it was literally all around us. The five elements are heartily available on the island, and if there was one constant in my life, it's been the continued focus on living my life in tune with the natural elements of our planet. The first element is fire, which represents the entire island. Fire created this volcanic island, after all, Fire is the spark of creation, the energy of transformation. What was once hot liquid fire hardened over time to create the land that I was sitting on, the land that stuck out of the sea in this sacred triangular formation. Fire is an intense energy that is associated with heat, of course, which explains my empathic friend's complete absorption of heat the entire time that we visited. The sun is also related to the fire element. And as I have said, we spent every day attending to the appreciation of the sun, probably just as the ancients had done. We always watched the sun set. We sometimes caught the sunrise. We always knew where the sun was. And although we were not there very long to notice any significant transits, I realized that the ancients must have done just that they would have recognized any differentiation of location of the sun immediately. Many of the Ahu where the Moai are set up align to the rising sun of the equinoxes or the solstices. So yes, they were aware and they acknowledged this ball of pranic fire in the sky by erecting great statues in its honor. And yes, fire is ever present there. The second element is earth. The hardening of liquid fire becomes earth, but it's also the foundation of our entire planet and associated with all life that exists on it. 
Because of the remoteness of Rapa Nui and the deforestation and devastation to much of the land, there were very few native animals and birds on the island. Upon our arrival, our host told us that there were no bugs. Well, we did find some, but the fact was there weren't many. There were also no snakes or reptiles except for one small lizard that was introduced. There are some birds, but not as many as back when the birdman cult thrived on the island. As for other mammals, wild horses and cattle roam freely today, but they've all been brought to the island from the mainland. Wherever life comes from, the reality is that when you see it, you really notice it. At home back in New Jersey, most people don't stop to watch the wildlife or better yet honor it. In Easter Island, I found that there was never a time that I didn't acknowledge life when I saw it, for it was so special. And also special is the rock that jutted out of the ocean upon which we stood. Were it not for that piece of earth being there, the island wouldn't exist at all. Right now, there's a major conservation effort to bring back areas of the island, and I want to say that at least half of it is in an active rehabilitation zone. Many historians and scientists refer to Easter Island as a cautionary tale for our planet, calling it a microcosm of planet Earth and using it as a perfect example of what can happen due to overpopulation and pillaging of the planet's natural resources. Things that many have warned us about for years, and today, what many more are now very concerned about, as the growing reality seems to be emerging, that we're closer than ever before to needing to find a new planet in order for our species to continue to be. I strongly feel that every person on our planet should have an experience such as living on a remote island like Easter Island to fully appreciate what the Earth has to offer us and to understand the significance of needing to know how we can work together as beings on this same rock to ensure that its life continues for eons to come. Air is the third element. And air is much prevalent here, for it's windy just about everywhere you travel. There was never a moment when I was outside on the island where I did not feel the existence of air. From a small breeze to a gusty wind, air is there to remind one to flow. While the earth may provide a stable foundation, the air reminds us not to get stagnant. Air or wind is the breath of life. Without air in our bodies, we would not be alive because there would be no breath. Rapa Nui's breath is ever present, inhaling and exhaling all around you, breathing you in and breathing you out. There's no escape until you hunker down inside an establishment or residence. And even then, the presence of air can usually be heard rapping against the building. I did a lot of deep breathing on Easter Island. And as a yoga teacher, I knew that this would keep me present in the moment, grounded and centered. But what I did not fully understand until after I left the island was how connected I had become to this pulsation of the island through its air. Its essence literally blew into me, and I became one with it. The fourth element is water, and this is certainly present since as an island the sea surrounds the entire landmass. Like the wind, this element is relentless as it pounds the shore on every side daily. This has no doubt caused a change in the shape of the shoreline since the volcanic stone is relatively soft and carvable. No matter what part of the island you're in, if you are near the shore, you can hear the roar of the sea and watch the spray. The waves crash in and flow back out, producing a trance-like state when you allow yourself the time to sit and watch. This meditative state brings calmness amongst the raging energy of the sea. And this dichotomy creates a surreal feeling like none I have ever experienced. The rational mind or ego may want one to be afraid of this unapologetic energy, but the presence of oneness that is felt 
reminds me that it's all just fine. In fact, all is freaking amazing. And that brings me to the final element, ether. Ether is that ever-present, mystical, magical energy that connects all. This is the embodiment of Rapa Nui itself. From this first sight of the island from above, as the clouds parted, God was present. At sunrise and sunset, God is seen. Every Moai and Ahu, whether it had been re-erected or was still lying face down and fallen into pieces, held an undeniable essence and energy. The palpations and vibrations of the place inspire a feeling of love, compassion, and appreciation for all. It is truly a magnificent and life-changing experience to have been there, and I'm forever grateful for all of the pieces that landed in place in order for me to be able to visit. One of the most famous explorers and historians that spent some time on Easter Island was a woman named Catherine Rutledge. In 1919, she wrote, In Easter Island, the shadows of the departed builders still possess the land. Their whole air vibrates with a vast purpose and energy which has been and is no more. What was it? What is it? I myself felt the same vast purpose and energy, and I know that it will one day reveal much knowledge that will be helpful for our species. I hope to one day return to Easter Island. I feel that I will. There are many mysteries that still surround the place, and I am confident that we are on the precipice of understanding more than ever before some of the ancient origins such as the Rongo Rongo language, which survived on only 25 tablets, all of which who have been removed from the island, and which today are still mostly undecipherable. The island still requires tender loving care. Mass tourism threatens the archaeological sites, as well as the life of the island. I understand the recent regulations to keep people off or limit access to certain sites. Perhaps, if we became more loving as a species, more understanding of our place on the planet, this would not be an issue. It was my personal experience that spending time on Easter Island certainly assured me of the understanding of my place on our planet. Naval of the world, that is for certain. In much gratitude and until I return again.